interested in uh, these brilliant examples of convergent evolution. So we got um, on this slide the butterfly moth, and, or not the butterfly moth, I'm sorry, the hummingbird moth and the hummingbird, and they both are distantly related and converged on similar phenotypes to feed on nectar. And then in the deep sea, we have these examples of bioluminescence with the firefly squid and the anglerfish that use bioluminescence to attract their unsuspecting prey. However, one of my favorite examples of convergent evolution is in with fishes. And so on the left, on this side, we got um, a gymnotiform, <laughs> and on this side, we have a more myriad. And these species diverged 290 million years ago, and they've converged upon really, really similar phenotypes. And to most people, these would look like the exact same fish. And they also converged upon uh, the ability to produce electricity. Um, so a really great example right, to study uh, convergent evolution is the order osteoglossiforms. So this order is a early diverging lineage of teleosts. And they are primary freshwater fish, and they have brilliant examples like this guy in the middle, the Aeroprima. He's the largest freshwater fish and reaches heights or lengths longer than me. We also have the arowana, which is the most expensive aquarium fish. It costs up to $400,000 for one of these. Um, and so these are just other examples of families in osteoglossiforms, but the most species rich uh, family is the Mormyridae. There's about 220 valid species. They, um, out of 250 in the entire order, they produce weak electric discharges that they use to sense their murky and nocturnal environments. And so many scientists got very obsessed with the idea that these fish were electric, and so they kind of ignored everything else about them. So <laughs> when you look at these fish, you can see that they have a diversity of different face morphologies. So to break that down, I'm gonna start with the boring one first. This is what I'm calling the normal face character, and he'll be denoted in this teal from now on. And so this just looks like your typical fish. Nothing too special going on. However, we have some guys that have a tube snout. So a tube snout is an elongation of the frontal bone, and it has a small mouth, and it used, uh, and it's used to extract insects out of holes in rocks or out of the substrate. And so their mouth is down here. Um, and so this will be denoted in red from now on. Next we have what I'm calling a chin swelling. And so chin swellings is like a massive flesh on their chin. Um, and this will be denoted in this yellowish color. An exaggeration of the chin swelling is something called a schnauzen organ. A schnauzen organ is actually a misnomer because it's not the nose, it's a chin. And so they have finite control over it, and so they can move their chin appendage around. And they use it to sift around in the substrate, and so it's like a really long chin swelling. And he'll be in gray from now on. Next, we have these really weird ones, and some of my favorite, that have both the tube snout, so they have an elongated mouth and their jaw at the very bottom, and then they have a flexible tube, or a flexible schnauzen organ. And so these guys are really, really weird. So, I wanted to do some ancestral state estimation to figure out how these traits evolved. However, the previous phylogenies that were published are based only on a couple of loci, or don't include all of the genera that I'm interested in. So to get around this problem, I had to infer my own phylogeny, and I used over 600 of our fish-like exons. I assembled them using ATRAM, um, and I have about 150 of the 220 valid species, so that's about 68% complete. Um, and I used a species tree uh, method in a straw, and then I needed a uh, ultrametric tree, so I used penalized likelihood, the Kronos pa package in R, to create an ultrametric tree. So here are my results. For the most part, this phylogeny is well-supported and resolved. So in the different colors, we can see these different uh, genera that are monophyletic. And then um, in the white are the couple of genera that are not monophyletic. So to me, Marcus was not a surprise that this uh, genus did not come out monophyletic because um, previous taxonomists had kind of suggested that this could be the case with Marcus and Tamaris. They kind of became uh, waste-thin uh, genera. However, what I was surprised to notice was this guy, Nathonemus. He came out not monophyletic. And why this is interesting is because Nathonemus is one of these fish that has a schnauzen organ, so it's flexible, and he is able to move it around. 
And so this, to me, is implying that these traits that are used to describe these genera are maybe not the best indicators of uh, forming a monophyletic genus. Um, so for my ancestral state estimation, I wanted to investigate the order in which these were, uh, the order in which these traits occurred, if transitions from a tube snout back to the normal face character were possible, or if transitions back from evolving a shell to an organ back to the normal face character were possible. So to do this, I used red face, and I used a time reversible jump model to uh, model the irreversibility. So here's my first um, sim mapping. And as this wasn't a very big surprise to find as the ancestral state was the normal face character. Um, from the normal face character, we move into a tube snout. And then the tube snout can either give rise back to the normal face character or to the chin swelling here. And so some of these tips, the changes occur really close to the edges. So I denoted them um, where the changes occur with these fish along the side. What I think is really interesting though, is from the chin swelling, we're going to having a tube snout with a schnauzen organ, or to having a schnauzen organ. So you have to go through this chin swelling state to, uh, uh, to be able to evolve either of the, uh, these more complex traits. Um, so then I coded my traits as either presence or absence. So I broke it down into either having a tube snout or not having a tube snout. And what you can see is that there's six independent um, gains of a tube snout and two reversals back. So these two reversals back happen within the same genus, within more mitris, which is uh, interesting to me that it doesn't happen all over the trees, only in one genus. So then when I use my uh, jump model, it showed that there's a faster rate of transition from going from having a tube snout to a flat face than there is from having a flat face to a tube snout. And when I first looked at this, I was kind of confused because that seemed uh, counterintuitive to me because there's six gains of a tube snout versus only two reversals back. But if we think about it and we look back at the tree, you can see that the, um, that the fish are spending so much more time in this normal face character before they're reaching any of these tube snouts. But then once they gain a tube snout, they're reversing back really fast. And so that's why that rate is faster back to the um, normal face character than it is to the tube snout. Next, I did the same thing with the schnauzen organ and chin swelling. So I broke it down into either there being a presence of the chin swelling or a schnauzen organ or there being no presence. So when I look at this, there's only two gains. And in each of these gains, there's one reversal back, which is really hard to see because it happens just at one of the tips. And then again, the rate is showing a much faster rate back towards having a normal face from having a, a schnauzen organ or a chin swelling. Um, so that's just also really fast. But um, in conclusion, the uh, face morphology transitions that we are seeing are ones from a flat or a normal face to a tube snout or a tube snout to a chin swelling, um, or a chin swelling to having a, uh, a tube snout and a schnauzen organ, or just a schnauzen organ. And then the, uh, inferred from my uh, ancestral state estimation, there's transitions that we never see. And that's a tube snout to a tube snout with a schnauzen organ, or a tube snout to a schnauzen organ, or a um, having the normal face character to this chin swelling, or to the schnauzen organ, or to the tube snout with the schnauzen organs. And then we're seeing much faster rates back into the normal face character than out of them. And with that, I would like to thank my lab and all of the uh, people at the Cornell uh, Museum of Vertebrates that <coughs> helped me and let me like go and have free range there. Um, and I can give you questions. <laughs>
Uh, their sperm actually don't have flagellum on them, so I don't know how they like survive in the wild, but. Um, so for Evo Devo, it's been kind of a challenge doing like knockouts with these guys. 